Across the world, and India takes the pride of place in it. In South India, Tamil Nadu and its capital city Chennai, on the shores of the Bay of Bengal, is one of the biggest centers for culture, economics and education. Carrying forward its heritage, Chennai has emerged as a modern hub for quality education and Sabita University is the leading and most sought after destination here. now in India as one of the top most engineering college. It's a house for 3,000 students and 8 departments. All the 8 departments offers graduate, postgraduate and PhD programs. We are starting with 3 more departments, Electrical and Computer Science, Biomedical Engineering and Bioinformatics. The engineering school is a 7 star building with 34 high tech classrooms with facilities like smart boards and Wi Fi networks. Do you know the best part of studying in Savita School of Engineering? Well, the answer is SFS Study Flex System, where we have the liberty to choose our course, timings, and our faculty. Sabita Learning Resource Center is a hallmark facility that houses thousands of books, e-journals, digital learning resources, discussion rooms and reference sections. Could you ask for more to inspire self-motivated learning? Savita graduates undergo two compulsory internships every year. Industry relevant projects and intensive labs ensures that Savita graduates are industry ready. the regulations here which helps me to score credits for publication of research papers in peer-reviewed journals. The world is bridging engineering with health sciences through biotechnology and bioengineering. I think Savita has an edge here because of its preeminence in medical education. Professor, now you can uh, share your screen. Okay. And then uh, I will give now a, you can uh, share your screen. Okay. okay. And uh, then I will uh, give a. Okay. okay. We are live now in Facebook. Okay. okay. Let me ha give you a formal introduction. Okay, Koki. Yeah. Very good afternoon to all of you present here. And a hearty welcome uh, to the guest, Dr. David Jenkins from University of Plymouth. Uh, we are in the fourth keynote session of our international conference uh, on recent trends in electronics, computing, and communication engineering, ICRTECC 2020, organized by Department of, uh, Institute of Electronics and Communication Engineering. Savita School of Engineering. I am Dr. Deepak, Associate Dean International Affairs. Uh, I, I'll be happy to introduce uh, Dr. David Jenkins. Dr. J David Jenkins is professor from University of Plymouth. He has completed his BSc Physics and uh, MSc in Laser Physics and PhD in Applied Physics. He has professional membership in Institute of Physics and uh, Institute of Engineering and Technology. His research interests include microsensors, actuator systems, surface plasma resonance and nanotoxicology, functional materials and microelectromechanical devices, graphene and sensors, active vibration control, microscopy, techniques like magnetic force microscopy, electron magnetic force microscopy, 
near field optics scanning laser microscopy he has also expertise in medical systems like laser interactions with dna and cells heart rate monitoring uh, he is also currently working in uh, areas such as uh, graphene based biosensors uh, filters using nanomaterials like graphene aerogels he, uh, he has published more than 100 publications in peer reviewed journals and conference proceeding and he is very active in research and also teaching he is also very closely as associated with uh, savita school of engineering uh, he is one of our uh, uh, external advisory member uh, and he uh, took part in various conferences e talks and he uh, he is in very close relationship with our university for more than 6 7 years by now and i am very glad and happy to welcome uh, dr david jenkins uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, talk on the topic detection of microplastics for filtration of microplastics in domestic waste sy systems uh, have, i i am warmly welcoming you sir please go ahead present your talk thank you so good good afternoon everybody um it's a nice um 9:30 in the morning here in plymouth um and we're going to talk about to so see the tiles detection of microplastics for filtration of microplastics in domestic water systems so that's what we're kind of looking at um the real heart of the talk is something which is I'll put there's a link for during during the talk for because we have um we have another talk where we're going to actually focus on the the actual filtration systems that we're developing but um this is a little look at the uh, the bigger picture and the the kind of the physics which is used to create the problem possibly and um and then the physics that hopefully we can use to solve the problem and you'll see it's the same physics so good bad good friend bad friend you may say okay so and i i know i know i when last time i was in in chen i will see all this uh, all this uh, no no plastics etc we shouldn't be having them which is fine for the single use plastics but obviously we know that um plastics are really useful things in life um but it's how we are managing them is the is the issue so so so, so one of the questions that that come that kind of may come up is um should should we be recycling plastics and um the answer surely has to be a big yes um but it's but we're more concerned with the um what we do once we've um got a number of plastics to kind of reuse in somehow so <clears throat> we'll we'll look at these various uh, issues as we go through this uh this talk um but the but the key the key part is like how how to sort plastics and then how to then detect plastics in water and and we're going to be using essentially the last part this detecting plastics in water as a means of developing um a filtration uh system that can be used in domestic situations so this will be for um uh essentially for washing machines <clears throat> but the problem that problem does extend far beyond washing machines we know in india and many other countries where um clothes may be washed in a slightly different way <clears throat> and hopefully we'll um we can get to kind of understand it the future can be quite a bright one <clears throat> so <clears throat> so recycling how 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 does it how does it kind of happen now obviously the in the in the sort of days of old and very much so even still today 2020 plastic materials came come in from waste collections and and people will still manually sort to some extent even even the the plastics that become automated in a recycling process are often pre-sorted to remove um other materials from from the from the items <clears throat> and um <clears throat> but we we're, we're going to focus on this on the on the material known as polyester um which will 
and and the and the the, the real bad environmental um, potential impact of when we wash these material when we wash these fabrics. And I bet every one of us is wearing something with polyester today. Um, I know there's lots of people say, oh, I can only wear cotton and wool, but we'll find that polyester is, is the predominant material in, in, in clothing. And, um, and then we're going to, and what we're going to see is uh, how we can use the sorting processes to develop the, the solution for these, these micro and maybe even nano plastics. We, we're not think microplastics start from about a millimeter and become smaller, but we're interested in those, those plastics which are going to um, pass through conventional filtration systems. So we're talking the sort of sub micron into the sort of um, maybe uh, tens, hundreds or more nanometers of um, in dimensions. So, <clears throat> So we're all we're all familiar with um, some of the um, the issues of you see there that lovely turtle probably thinks that's something to eat. Um, quite often the, the these kind of bags often look like food to um, lots of creatures. Obviously, they shouldn't be eating them. The, these things shouldn't be in the ocean. They these bags should be in that pile you can see, sort of like here. In the middle, this is where lots of things are, should be going. But what we know is we got all of these micro, these are fairly large, but it's these microplastics, which then this little fish here is, is ingesting, not because he wants to, but they're in the water. And you know, that's part of their, their, um, their uh, functional system. And obviously, you know, we're in, we're in the days of COVID-19, coronavirus, Cove SARS 2, depending which which kind of um, terminology you wish to use to define the scenario. And now we've got an ever increasing situation. Now we can call this, we're interested in PET. This is what we call PEP waste, personal, this is post personal protection um, clothing. People are using and discarding. So it's not, it's not a good scenario. So, <clears throat> So, so what we what we're more what we're concerned with is the material that um, has a slightly different um, name. So, it, it is polyethylene terephthalate. But when we put the, the small r in front of it, then this is what we're concerned with. This so this is the recycled polyester, which pe people are using now to make all of these um, these coats, shirts, trousers, probably, I know people like to wear silk saris, but I'm sure there are people where there are some polyesters in, ev in everything, <clears throat> okay? And so, in, and in, um, I know in India, the, the, the situation does extend further because I know lots of people will wash clothes uh, on the edges of rivers and lakes. <clears throat> but, um, that's another situation to, to solve. We can't solve everything in straight away. We can't even solve this one yet. So let's look at um, <clears throat> these materials. So, so what, what, what is the source of all this, this um, PET? As you can see, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it covers the whole of life. You see it's used for building materials, things in the home, often cases for your, your phone, maybe, medical devices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're always told that we must recycle, 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 which is, which is good. We, shan't, we can't put these into, land, into landfill. Not good. Um, in the UK now, a lot of materials that would go into landfill now incinerated for energy generation, but really that's still not a a brilliant solution. And you can spot the deliberate mistake on this slide here. Seem to have added an extra E on the end there. Um, <clears throat> because often we, we normally, whilst it can maybe be known here, but oh, we're going to be talking as just PET. Okay. <clears throat> and you see there's many other 
similar materials, high and, day, high and low density polyethylene, polypropylene, we had polystyrene, um, quite a few materials. And the challenge in an automated system is how, how do you actually um, sort these materials? Okay, so, so by hand, it's, it's not um, simple. Um, obviously, a lot of packaging will have the, the, um, the kind of label in here, so you can identify it. But the idea here is, is an automated system that can literally look at these materials and, and sort them rapidly um, for subsequent um, processing. <clears throat> So, so if we, for example, look at PET and PVC, <laughs> if we're going to be reusing these materials, then it is important that they are separated correctly. Okay, so we do know, for example, here, if you have one bottle of uh, made of PVC in a large batch of PET, then, the, then if you're going for a melt, recycle, then or reprocessing, then then it causes um, significant issues. So, <clears throat> and actually, you know, these, these materials often look the same. I mean, you wouldn't know picking these up which one was which by hand. So, so we so we have to turn to sort of science to help us. And what we all see is that the um, like physics is used to. Uh, to identify them in, in the laboratory and then to apply um, some different physics to then uh, apply that technology, that kind of physics into the real environmental uh, recycling plant. So, so, so the, um, the key here is is using is, is infrared spectroscopy, and and that and, and this this covers in this case um, um, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, near infrared spectroscopy, and uh, Raman spectroscopy. Um, all, all why 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 are these um, spectroscopies so useful? Okay, well the the key will be on the next slide to show you why. The, the near IR is um, the most useful wavelength for us. But if, if you're not familiar with um, sort of like the, the spectral band that we're kind of that we're going to talking about, you can see here that that like they say the human eye is 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 able to see from the kind of blue blue violet around 400 nanometers. And we can go all the way up to around 700 nanometers. So this corresponds to the visible. And then we go down into the UV, heading down, down there into sort of UVA, UVB, and into UVC, which UVC is filtered out by the ozone layer. And then we go up into the region here, into the, into the kind of near infrared. And this is the area where the, um, the properties and materials are are a little bit more useful for us in terms of um, identification. We often talk about the, the, um, the infrared signature. So you can see here, this is just for one um, material, hexane, but you can see this kind of spectra that we would obtain in this system. So, so this is a, a Fourier transform uh, spectroscopy and and it, and, it, and it kind of covers the sort of um, sort of up to, up to a few microns uh, in terms of wavelength, and it, and what we can see here is how how it works in the lab. So so we'll have um, we have to have a say a crystal, and, and we have to have our substrate. So what we're going to be looking for here will place be in very close contact. So we'll actually make good contact with the crystal. So we'll have, so, so remember this is in the laboratory. So, so we can put our plastic clamped onto the, um, the um, crystal and then infrared light will pass through the crystal. And as you can see, as you can see, we get this, uh, this kind of a 
we could sort of like a, a waveguide kind of mode so the thing will bounce up and down through the system and it will emerge to be detected. Okay, so in this case here, we then have to vary this wavelength and then we're measuring the output as a function of wavelength. Okay, so this so this is this is a so this is an attenuated system. So um, so we can see now the the bands. So now we can see which wavelengths are absorbed by by hexane, and you can see, and, and this is this is its kind of signature. And so this is the kind of principle that we will apply to then looking at um, the plastics. Okay, so we're not going to look at all of the plastics here because the focus is on is, is on PET. <clears throat> okay, so 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 with a, with some uh, PET or PVC, you can see now the the spec the absorption um, wavelengths of this particular material, and you can see this is very quite unique. And then we go to PVC, and we'll see a totally different uh, spectral um, signature. Okay, so, but we need to go a little bit further than that. Can we, well, what we're trying to make is a system that could be applied in a robust industrial environment. So, so we don't need to make any notes of these um, particular um, wavelengths at the minute. But just to show, for example, in terms of um, high, and, high and low density of the same material, you can see here for HDPE and LDPE, again, we will get a spectra which will have sort of key wavelengths. And there again, you can see they, they're quite different when we compare the high density and the low density. So we need to go from this particular um, system to a, a working system. So how does it work? Well, we need to go from for example, the situation on the left. So in Plymouth, we have um, we have a number of um, FTIR instruments. We have a, and also we have a Raman spectroscopy. Um, so we we can do this work. In fact, one of our colleagues, Professor Richard Thompson, this has become his life his life work. So so all of our uh, uh, really up-to-date FTIR, up FTIR instruments all come from the work done by Richard Thompson and his colleagues who are um, pioneers globally of microplastics research. So we need to be able to take this kind of system here into a form that can be used not on this uh, wagon, but when we get to the actual recycling plant itself. <coughs> So, and, and these, these systems are able to make these kind of um, automated um, sorting choices according, accordingly. Okay. <clears throat> but as I say, we're, we're focusing on here, this is our key one, this polyethylene terephthalate, the PET. Okay, so... <clears throat> So there, there are some issues of sorting these materials when uh, using spectroscopy when the materials are not like you can see here, but when they are dark, opaque materials, it does cause us some, some um, uh, problems to kind of work with. But for the, these type of materials here, we can, we can actually work through... Um, Sorry, I hadn't switched slides. So these, these particular materials here are more difficult to um, to, to uh, identify um, using um, FTIR and more so with Raman. But these particular ones here are a lot a lot simpler to work with, and and form maybe the majority. But there are other systems which which we won't talk about in this um, in this lecture, but. Often the, the automated recycling systems will have a vision systems as well. So they're actually able, because often we know that the particular um, structure of, of the plastic, its shape is often linked to um, applications and materials. So, 
So often we can identify some of these using vision systems. <clears throat> okay, so what, what we're trying to, uh, <clears throat> so what we're trying to do, so how, how can we identify these materials? Why does this infrared spectroscopy help us in, in this effort? Okay, so what we need to, to, to do is think about um, what's actually going on in the infrared as opposed to the visible. So, um, so, to, I'm not, so, so if, you come in, if you're coming from, a, say, an electrical engineering background, you may not be so familiar with um, some of this. So, so talk about that very briefly. Um, so quite often, some materials can be kind of uh, classified using sort of uh, ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. And this is spectroscopy that looks at the electronic the electron transitions within materials, i.e. exciting electrons from the ground state to a higher state. But once we go to um, the near infrared, the, the, the actual photons that, the, that are trying to excite the material have a lot less energy. OK, so that they're not they don't have energy to excite electrons into the um, into excited states. But what they do have is the the ability to um, look at the actual um, vibrations, rotations of the of the of the molecules. Okay, <clears throat> so so for example here, we can see for example with ethylene, we're looking at this uh, CH bond. Now now these these so in this particular molecular system, then you can see we have a number of possible. Um, ways these materials or these molecules are able to um, interact when excited. So, so, so these are able to, we can see there's symmetrical stretching, asymmetric stretching, rocking, scissoring. Okay, so, 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 these, so the energy associated with these particular um, mo motions are, are, are much lower but what we need to do now is find out which which of our um, which wavelengths of our excitation source can stimulate these uh, vibrational and rotational modes within within the uh, molecular system. And and um, and when we when we then apply that to a whole range of plastics, then we see that we come up with this, these kind of spectral bands. Um, and what we now need to do is how can we take the spectra that you can see here and produce a very robust system that can easily identify between PVC, PET, PP, for example. <clears throat> okay, so what we need to say, what, what are the what are the unique features of it, these materials? <clears throat> so continuing in, in the, our kind of uh, um, way of, of looking at this, you can see now that, um, for, for example, PET has, whilst it has the, shares these, these, free, these wavelengths, it has a unique feature at 1688 nanometers. OK. And and similarly, we can see for the HDPE that we get these. We can we can distinguish them by the one, two, three, seven and one, four, sixty nanometer wavelengths. <clears throat> so. So now we, so what we're going to have to what we need to do is develop a system that is able to enable, enable us to work in. in um, Using these key frequent these key wavelengths as the means of um, of sorting materials out and and what you can see here is what we have we've done here so you can see now for for the, these materials here there are uh, five um, unique wavelengths and so we so we need to be able to um, identify what happens at those wavelengths as a, as materials pass through an, an automated system. Okay, so it needs a little bit more work. So we now know that we've got a number of wavelengths, which gives us a unique, so if we get a, if we get a reflectance, 
a strong reflectance, uh, say this uh, 1668, for example, then we can say that this is P material is PET. Okay, <clears throat> but remember we're working in the near infrared. So, so the, so the things you normally think about illuminating the sample using a detector, now they work in principle, but not in practice because um, your light source, you have to understand what it's emitting in, in this kind of a spectral band, which detectors will work in, in order to help you um, see the reflected light. And then we also got to then um, separate the reflected light to see what the spectral components are. Okay, so in in the, in the visible, we would just use, we could often just use um, um, a broadband white light source and a silicon photo detector. But unfortunately, silicon stops working at eleven hundred nanometers, so we have to kind of uh, make some uh, some changes. <clears throat> okay, so. So we need to find out the, the, the correct light source. And, and here we're often interested in something called color temperature. And this gives us um, a measure of the spectral response of, the, of this uh, light source. And, um, and you can, and for, for this one with a color temperature around just under 3000 Kelvin, it is, covers the, the bands that we're, kind of interested in, which is these, this kind of region here. So you can see some of these are much less useful and down here, possible. Awesome. We're getting, we're getting hassled. Okay, so, so we can eliminate these, um, these materials and then we got to make a, a, so we have to detect them. Okay. So we can't just use a silicon, we need to use um, uh, detectors that work in the kind of near infrared. So this is sort of, in some ways, uh, similar to uh, optical communications where, which work uh, at 1.3, 1.55 microns. <laughs> so, so in this particular application, we may choose an Indian gallium arsenide photo detector array. <laughs> and as you can see here, its its response its responsivity across the the spectral band of interest for us. Okay, so so we now have a light source. We have a, a detector. So what we will do is we'll illuminate with this this kind of broad um, spectral source. We'll get according to so if we have um, a PET or for example then then the reflectance will have a, a, a spectral composition that you have seen before. So how do we separate this out? So now, now we go into um, using sort of a Bragg, Bragg gratings. Okay, so a, a Bragg grating essentially <clears throat> will, will um, change its response according to angle and wavelength. Okay, so so we can so we can actually have um, a broad a broadband incoming source with spectral components that when they pass when they um, interact with the grating, they will actually um, you, you, they will kind of be diffracted, and we will get um, that the actual the, the spectral components will be separated, and then we have to then have detectors which are responsive at the key um, wavelengths which we saw here. Okay, so we will have so we will have the detectors here, 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 and here according to the, the Bragg um, conditions. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so so this, so this is the kind of basis of this, this kind of um, automated uh, recycling. We'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep looking, but just to kind of see about um, recycling these, these, these uh, materials. So it, it goes back kind of like over 40 years that we've been kind of um, 
doing this and why 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 is it so important um obviously to stop landfill but we can see these are why people want to get these materials people want to make say cardigans ski jackets etc um and it does take quite a lot of uh of these bottles to do it so 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 recycling all on an automated um process is is a little bit like this so so this company in france of paprec they, they're one of the bigger uh players globally in automated recycling and automated recycling is not so common that if you go to any recycling plant that you will find this kind of system. That's, that is not the case. But these systems are being developed um, because when you, we don't really have time to, to look at some of the videos of these things, but if you see a video of these in action, you can see how they can rapidly sort hundreds and thousands of, of different plastic items um, with very high accuracy in, in a in a very very fast time the materials literally fly off the conveyor belt they're identified and um and then air jets are used to to sort them into um different collectors but as you can still see there's still you can't eliminate the kind of the, the um the hands-on component of these systems still <clears throat> so so this will end up producing say um, batches of different um, you, one types of plastics and and then we go on to what are you going to do with them next so we've got all of these plastics <clears throat> okay and so in in some applications that we're totally happy with the processing so <laughs> but normally we see this is the so sort of this is where you are at home. They go into this on a sorting process. Then they, they end up then being sort of uh, uniquely separated. And then they go through different processes according to the end application. But you can see they, they get kind of broken down, cleaned and either sometimes, sometimes these plastics, for example, in, we can make plastic bottles again by essentially uh, melting them and then just reforming them and that's a fantastic process it doesn't cause us any issues unless they end up at this particular point in another recycle so you can go round and round this cycle quite a few times and so so we end up with for example um, batches of PET pellets or we may call them RPET they're, they're recycled <coughs> so 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 we end up in this particular system so so they've been re so this is the point where we said sort of are now into a, a material that can be uh, used to make different fabrics that we can then then we're making for example garments <coughs> etc but what what we're interested in is this particular point here is that the, these garments are used many many times so they end up here in this, this, this wonderful washing machine. And then, and then the water goes through wastewater treatment, and then it goes into the rivers and the sea. <clears throat> now, now this particular part here is where we're kind of um, we have our concerns because for for um, for waste the wastewater management here deals very effectively with large, large things, um, sort of millimetres and up, they, these things all get removed, but the very small things will end up going through the whole of the, the wastewater management process. And at that point here, if you can exclude the microplastics, the water here at this point that's going into the river is, is pretty good, okay? Um, this is the water then then form in the UK. This would normally go into reservoirs. In in um, I've, for example, I know in India a lot of this water then will become um, the source of uh, water 
in villages, in wells, and obviously will end up in, in the urban environment. <clears throat> so that's what happens, but what we're not happy because, because um, at the minute <clears throat> we don't have, what we want is to have this system here. So the water can go through this, this filter and into, into the rivers without any of the microplastics. Okay, so how big a problem is this? It's a massive problem. Okay, so this is work, this is some work that's uh, carried out by say Richard Thompson and his group in Plymouth. And you can see this is, uh, this is from one of the UK consumer magazines, number of washing machines being tested. And look at that, 700,000 fibers in each cycle of a washing machine. And some homes will cycle will cycle their washing machine every day. I mean, I, I, I try to be pretty good. I mean, I, I live alone, so um, not so many things to do, but so one time a week. So every week I'm probably releasing all of these fibers into the, into the environment. Um, so this is not a particularly uh, healthy situation for us to be in. There's a, and so there's a couple of links you can follow to, to see this, see what's going on. So the world is quite into these kind of plastics. <clears throat> so, so what we're trying to do is, is uh, come up with a means of um, improving this, this uh, domestic situation. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we may find that there are other, other materials that, that um, may fall into these, like these emerging contaminants. But then anything that's in the sort of a sort of submicron, maybe closer to the sort of into the kind of um, nanomaterials um, end of the dimensional spectra, can um, are just simply not removed at all. So, so what we so what we're working on in at the minute is trying to um, see how we can use the, 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 the physics that we use to produce these materials to now identify and, and remove them. Okay, so if you, if you go online, you can see there's a, there's a few people that have come up with some solutions. Like there's a, there's a bag, like a net, you put all your clothes in and apparently this big meshy bag removes all your nano materials, uh, micro materials. Um, not, to not totally sure that that's um, working very well from what we can see. Um, people, have, people have tried to design filters that work on the sieving effect, i.e. pores which are smaller than the particles you wish to ca capture. So as the water will pass through, these essentially collect on the, on the, on the surface, of the sieve, and then very shortly that, that filter will need to be cleaned or replaced. <laughs> but what we do know uh, with, with plastics is that it's very easy um, to, uh, to, to charge, to make them positively or negatively charged. And this has been employed as one potential method of sorting plastics, right, as opposed to optical, using the charge of these materials and say it, it does work with uh, PET <clears throat> but um, the work that um, Jonathan Bloor has been doing in Plymouth um, possibly has a possibly a much better solution where we can actually design a filter where the pores are actually pretty big and the, the materials don't get trapped by dimensional features but by charge, okay? <clears throat> and that's where we'll, we'll briefly look at that. And so, and again, we're trying to make these, these filters also to be, you know, sort of um, environmentally friendly. So, <clears throat> so, so the idea of this work is looking at um, sort of graphene-based materials. 
If we say graphene based, everybody listens. They think it's really exciting, but actually we're not. We're not using graphene itself. We 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 take graphite. Use the the fame vary a variation on the infamous or famous Hubble uh, Hummer's method to to um, enable us to to um, form the material graphene oxide. So graphene oxide. If you if you look at you can see here this kind of what we see as our pristine graphene um, structure. And graphene oxide is a little bit like that, but it but it has some defects. No, sorry, it doesn't have any defects. It has lots of functional groups attached. So so epoxy, carboxyl, hydroxyl groups attached. Um, it's a low cost material, but on its own is is um, not so usable, but um, Johnny has been um, working to develop means of using let's say, graphene oxide with biomaterials to form um, aerogels. <coughs> and so, so we now have this question now we can say filtration versus sorption. So, so we're not, so the materials that have been developed work on a sorption basis. So so what are these so what are these aerogels like? <clears throat> so aerogels are net of recently become uh, so these are kind of commercially available, but we're, we're designing specific ones. There are lots of different um, kind of recipes to make these these kind of structures and and out and the structures that we have we've been developing are, are pretty unique and and uh, we'll see how for some excellent um, properties. <laughs> so, so, so these this kind of see these are the lightest materials known to man. They're 99 point something percent space. It's a little, a little bit like in having a small, having the, the, the volume of a of a big swimming pool in the size of a teacup. Okay, it's it's all space and it's a, um, a as you can as you'll see it's a it's, it just looks like a kind of um, a, a bubbly honeycomb kind of three dimensional structure, which is, um, but it's biogradable and biocompatible. So, so these are the sorts of ones that, that sort of Johnny's kind of been working on. These are actually sort of uh, ones that Johnny has actually made in Plymouth. <coughs> And um, we'll see how incredible the their properties are. But remember, we can we can adapt these these uh, the functionality of these aerogels. And so, what often we do, we can we can they can be kind of um, we can play around with things to make them hydrophobic, olivophobic, olivophilic, hydrophilic. Um, so they can be used for um, absorbing dyes. Uh, we we. We've done work on absorbing lead, which is the, the, pre, the main focus of the work, absorbing heavy metals in, in water. Um, we can use them to separate oils from water. And um, so we have a nice little video here to, if it will play, just to show you some of the things that uh, we've been playing around with these aerogels. So if this, will this play? Yeah, so here you can see, so oil, oil and water with a dye is mixed. And then we pour it. Now this is gonna, now gonna be passing through the aerogel. Well, not all of it will pass through. You'll see some will, some will pass through and some will stay. And hopefully you can see down here that the water that is actually um, being collected and the the um the dyed oil rapeseed seed oil you can see um is separated so i'm not sure if johnny's done it but you could drink that water quite safely <clears throat> So, like in all of these, all of this kind of research, we have to do 
we have to do a number of kind of tests which are not directly related to what we are maybe doing, but to, to, to show how they work. So, so Johnny does, so the next kind of test, Johnny's been doing more recently with, with um, lead added to water. But, but um, again, to get a feel for how these are working, Johnny was playing around with, uh, just to look in your absorption of um, methylene blue. <clears throat> and, um, and this, this case here is working on the sort of the, the lower concentrations and, and water passed through these, these aerogels will, will essentially remove all the methylene blue from the water. <clears throat> Okay, so then we're going on to the, and to what's really interesting, I think, is, is, is the next one here. So, so remember, if with a sieve for filtering particles, they block quite quickly. Um, so you may be happy to clean them more often or possibly replace them quite often. But here, because in a small volume, we essentially have an enormous filter we have an enormous capacity. Um, and so when, when this work goes towards the real applications of um, lead, in, lead contamination in, in um, water for drinking, we know then that the levels of lead will be very low, but above safe um, levels. But to see how well these work, John has been using enormous amounts of lead and um, and uh, he, he, in order to, to see what's going on here, then <coughs> we have to use some um, some more in instrumentation tools to uh, to look at the work. So off to here, ICPMS will be used, which is a mass, which is a um, mass spec uh, spectroscopy to to kind of to identify what is in the water. And what is, and also we need to know what is in the, the aerogel. But as you can see here, so this, so this is a very high concentration, 100 parts per million. And, and, um, and what you see is that the, the, initial, the initial time, the, the, uh, the absorption, the sorption is very, very high, very, very fast. But it keeps on going. Um, and this has an absorption capacity of 635 milligrams per gram so so if we extend this to um say sort of nanomaterials like plastics in the water essentially we, we have the capacity to absorb a lot of um plastics before the filter has to be attended to okay so but this goes a little bit further so um, so this is for lead, but when you kind of change the system slightly, then, then we can kind of, uh, and this is what Johnny was looking at for um, desalination of blackish water, where, the, where the, the salt levels are not so high. But now you have what we call an, an active filter. Okay, and, and uh, so you can see we buy, it's, it's a relatively low voltage. But it means we can actually separate according to charge. So this is this can be a means of um, collecting a number of different plastics that may be present in in the in the wastewater according to whether they're positively or negatively charged. And let's say massive um, capacitance. So this so this is the kind of things we're kind of interesting to to see can these be developed so if you want to find out more about these aerogels because that's the that's the real hot hot work for us then um then you can um you can you can register for this uh again it's just like you're doing in savita this is one in a vit so it's a one-day virtual conference on microplastics um, Johnny and, and I are um, giving one talk together in this, but uh, this is a chance to, to, to hear one of the world experts here, Richard Thompson. Um, I think he's our the first member of our university to become a fellow of the Royal Society. 
So he's a real kind of hot, he's the hot man on the scene. And you can hear Richard talking about uh, microplastics. Okay, so when we come full circle, <clears throat> is a, uh, so we've got to develop these aerogels. So it, we can't just make an aerogel, um, put it in a washing machine and everything's fine. So what we need to know is what's going into, what's going into the filter and what's going out of the filter. And that is exactly what Johnny does in this work here. But he uses ICPMS. We're going to try and do it a different way. So we'll be looking to use either Raman, spectroscopy, FTIR, or maybe even some uh, microfluidic based um, sen sensor systems. So, um, <clears throat> You know, we would, we would normally use one or the other uh, of these. Um, Raman is more useful for the smaller particle sizes. If you want to be very, very robust in your um, analysis of the materials, then you would use both together because we find that the, these, these um, are, they're complementary um, techniques. Okay, so, so the idea here is we're not going to be using um, plastics as we did before. Before we have a hard piece of plastic, we could clamp onto the uh, system and work with. Now it's a different kind of approach where the, these microplastics will be dispersed into water and then, and then they will be applied onto a, a small filter so this is not, not quite like a coffee filter, but you know, it's a very small pore filter to collect the plastics. And these plastics are then analyzed in an FTIR or Raman system. And so again, what we're trying to do is, so we're interested in, in using FTIR to see what we've actually got. So what particles have we got in the system? And again, you can see the, the, unique, the unique wavelengths of, um, of these materials are, are crucial. And you hear that you can see how a dark particle has been analyzed as a polyethylene, and this orange one as polypropylene, for example. <laughs> and there here, this is a fiber that's been collected and, and it's been shown to be acrylic. Yeah, this is all using um, say attenuated total reflection, but people also using um, Raman. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> now, Raman microscopy or spectroscopy is a is again looks at these rotational vibrational uh, bonds <laughs> um, to produce a similar um, kind of a spectra. But note that what we see here on on the x axis is not wavelength or so. Although it's in sense, it's, it's in wave numbers. It's actually the Raman shift. So this is the the, the wavelength of the light, um, which is collected, and how it sh how it differs from the incident uh, wavelength. And you can see here it works quite well for these particles at down to like say 500 nanometers. But when we get down to the, the baseline here, you can see that the the spectra is fairly weak. So is there an answer to that? The answer possibly will be to go to something called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. And that will put, and that's another thing that, um, that needs to be explored. So this tells us what's in the water before the filter and after the filter, and we're almost there. Okay, so, but we also need to know what, what are these particles looking like? So colleagues at IASC Bangalore have been developing a microfluidic system and they've been looking at these to count and identify the, um, the shapes of blood cells. Um, and we think we can combine this, again, as a means of characterizing the, um, the particles before filtration and after filtration as a means of um, designing an effective aerogel. And so hopefully we can end up with a system here where this washing machine pumps its water through the aerogel and now it's happy. So what have we done? Well, 
recycling, like everything in life, there's a swing and a roundabout. You win some, you lose some. So mostly we win, but but we know that nature loses sometimes. So, so the, we see that we use, for example, Fourier transform infrared and near infrared spectroscopy to sort these materials. We know that when they're washed, they produce these plastics that are, are harmful to the environment. We need to design a filtration system that can work. And the, we, this has been part of a, of a kind of, a, what do you call it, consortium. We have a thing, a group that's working in the southwest of England and this, and on, on, on kind of a sustainable water management, this is an issue that's, uh, that keeps coming up. So can we develop materials for this? We know we can. Can we make them work for plastics? We're pretty sure we can. And then we know so now we can use these um, tools that we used initially to see if we've identified um, a filtration system that can work effectively. Remember, because these, these, these aerogels have big pores compared to the particle sizes, the water will flow through still fairly effectively. So we're not changing the dynamic of the system, we're just removing all of the, the nasties. And hopefully we can then have some happy fish. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Indeed, it was a very uh, great talk and uh, enlightening one. Uh, you have shared about plastics, types of plastics, microplastics, and uh, the drawbacks of microplastics, hazards of microplastics. And uh, also you have given us a solution, like a possible solution of using graphene aerosols uh, to use it as a filter to avoid micro um, plastics from reaching the river or sea. So thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, now let us open the forum for uh, question and answer session. Uh, participants, uh, you can please uh, ask your questions now, please. It always goes quiet. <laughs> You can you can post them on the chat as well. Yes, yes. Any questions? Hello, Professor Deepak sir. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. Um, sir, I may be introduce yourself and yes, you are audible, madam. Please ask the question. Yes. Sir, this is Dr. Shivagami from Institute of EC, Savita School yes. of Engineering. I have a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, normally, water analysis could be done with the help of either chromatography or else electrical conductivity. But uh, yes. why you selected uh, peculiarly like evanescent uh, wave analysis, sir? Is there any reason for it, for selection of it? Um, well, if, well if the, cl the classic um, way of identifying these microplastics has become FTIR, and this, this is this, what everyone is using, because it gives us this unique, very, it's very fast. It doesn't require any real sample preparation. Um, so you can take plastics and put them in an FTIR as a kind of bulk material, or you can just pass them through. You can filter them, filter them out of water. And again, you can put them into FTIR and get, and get the answer very soon. The, all the FTIR systems, like, like all of these spectroscopy systems, have, have all their nice library features. But people know, people soon know what um, spectral bands to look at. So it's a very fast way of identifying these these uh, common materials. So we, we are we are we are we are not uh, microplastics um, scientists, but we are. But we work in the same um, research areas. So so we we use FTIR and Raman for all of our research. So we're just applying it to. Um, to work with microplastics and it's and it's what say Richard Thompson's group all of their work is based around um FTIR but I say we do use ICPMS as well um we haven't used we haven't used any other spectroscopic tools though not to say we can't but this these work very well for us and um and there's no reason to to 
to use a different system at the minute, but always welcome to suggestions. Oh, that's fine, Professor. I have another query also. Yes. Uh, with the help of UV purifier, uh, we can purify our water up to 0 0.01 micron, it seems. Right. As far as your slide concerned, uh, yeah. microplastic exists greater than 5 micron, it seems. Yes. Why can't it be possible to purify uh, with the, our regular RO or uh, UV system itself uh, to filter or to filtrate your uh, microplastics? Um, Why it is not possible? Remember, this, 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 this filter is supposed to go into the outlet of a washing machine. So, into a domestic, so this will essentially be, um, <clears throat> it's just, with these aerogels have been designed. So, for example, um, if, if people, uh, say, pump water from a well into a bottle, the idea is that the, these aerogels can actually fit in the in the top of the bottle. So when you drink, the water will just pass through, and remove these um, contaminants. So we're just adapting this the same um, kind of technology to work with microplastics. So they're designed to be kind of uh, compatible with um, the systems that they're going to be used in. That's that's pretty well why we we've gone down this approach. Um, you can use, there are lots of ways you can use uh, UVC to remove uh, some nasty things. We can use um, other filtration techniques, but this aerogel seems to for us to give us um, the means of having good filtration with good throughput i.e. you don't have to pump the water to get it through the filter it will just pass through so it kind of passes through not maybe not quite in real time so you pass the water into the filter it may take a little bit longer to come through but in a washing machine the water is pumped so it will be able to go through without um, affecting the system at all so it should be kind of retrofitable because so all, all these washing machines they have they have filters and we're just saying Let's let's replace all of those filters, or maybe we put our filter after there. So we, we need we need to have a means of removing um, larger particles, and and that is done in washing machines. And we're just putting this into essentially, we're taking water which is essentially looks clean, but it's but it isn't, and to remove those those small um, contaminants from it. That's all. Oh. That's, that's good. That's, yeah. It's very good. Thank you, Professor. Thank okay, you. Thank you. you have introduced another area for all the researchers. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. So John, much, yeah, John is doing brilliantly with, I mean, these filters for, for lead work about 10 times better than activated carbon filters. So okay. we'll, we'll, we'll be publishing this, this quite shortly. <laughs> very nice. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Any any other questions from uh, participants? Okay, I have a question. Uh, you talked about the time scale and the duration. Uh, you have shown uh, how much it can filter out. Initially, yeah. it, it was very high, and then slowly it was reducing. Uh, yeah. Is there a lifetime for these aerosols? Like what is the uh, lifetime for these aerosols, and how often we need to replace it? Well, this is this yeah. So the lifetime often going to depend on what goes into it. But um, one one thing we we've been kind of looking at is um, because because these are we uh, maybe either modifying these fields, maybe modifying the structures or so to try and um, identify for maybe the impedance of the filter, the the contamination levels of it. You're trying to see how its properties change electrically as, as a means of identifying when the filter needs to be changed. But we do know from the fact that the, there's such a large volume to capture materials within, as you see, when, if, if you, when we take lead, for example, where the levels are low in water, but harmful, we can probably run this for, I, I, so this is not a very technical answer, but a long time. 
quite a long time. Um, and we could probably kind of, uh, uh, we could probably do some calculations by seeing sort of like what the capacity, so if we, we absorb, you see what we could absorb, we can we could easily probably do some little calculations and see what that would correspond to in time for um, levels around about acceptable for drinking supplies. But it, it is significant. There's an, it's not a short, doesn't need to replay very often. But obviously, yeah, we want to make them. Um, so, so we made them biocompatible, biodegradable, um, but also they can be, it may be in the future, they may be able to uh, be reprocessed by uh, passing through water of a different pH level to kind of unbind the contaminants so, if, so they can be kind of um, removed and then the filter may be used again. But we're not, we're not that far yet. In a minute, was, Johnny's been, uh, say, working on these for the lead. And um, the, next, the next thing, he's not got too long to go before he finishes. But it'd be nice if we get chance. But it's difficult with lockdown. We've not been in the lab for three months. So um, it would be nice to finish the PhD with a same graph, but starting at low levels and see how quickly the, 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 they are removed. And then... Um, then, then we can maybe look at seeing what we could do do with these materials. It's pretty exciting stuff, and then they're pretty robust. Um, when they're dry, it's a little bit different. As soon as they're in water, they become a very robust. And these things, they go in at ICPMS. They spin round for hours and hours without falling apart. So they're a pretty strong material. Very good. Very good. Yeah, it's very good work on this stuff. <laughs> so tune in on 30th of June to hear more. <laughs> okay, I'll be there. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if there is no more question, uh, may I uh, request our uh, program director, madam, and uh, convener of this conference, ICRET, uh, ECC, to address a few words? Madam? Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor David Jenkins. Uh, this keynote talk was uh, very informative and it was thought provoking. Savitra School of Engineering extends our thanks, especially to you, Professor, as you always accept our invitation and be part of our family. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, with this uh, keynote talk, we are actually successfully ending our today's international conference on recent trends in electronics, computing and communication 2020. So I take this opportunity to give the vote of thanks uh, by thanking our beloved Chancellor, Director, Principal and Vice Principal for their support in successfully completing this conference. I thank all keynote speakers who made this conference truly international. I must definitely thank all my faculties who are holding hands together to make this event successful one. And uh, I must not forget to talk, thank a uh, few faculties who were all through with me for a month in organizing this conference. They were fulfilling our institute dreams without any hesitation. So I must thank Dr. Deepak, Dr. Swaminathan, Mr. Bhaskar Rao, Dr. Radhika Bhaskar, Dr. Reji, Mr. Prem Kumar, Ms. Bhuneshwari, and Dr. Shamla. I must also thank our Institute HODs who were peer reviewing all the papers and chaired various sessions. At this time, I must also say that we are planning to have an international conference every two years once. So tentatively, we can declare here our third ICRT ECC 2020 will be scheduled in the year 2022. Thank you all once again in attending this ICRT ECC 2020 organized by Institute of EZ, Savita School of Engineering, Chennai. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, you, you are the very uh, great support for all of us. And uh, this, this was possible uh, with all your support, madam.
thank you very much and thank you professor and uh, uh, for your uh, keynote talk thank you uh, good day to you okay goodbye <laughs> bye have a good evening yeah, yeah. <laughs> bye bye thank you everyone thank you okay oh